Hi, I'm Fran Stoddard. Tonight we connect with Megan Epler-Wood, a pioneer in the ecotourism industry who continues to have extraordinary impact worldwide. Megan Epler Wood founded the International Ecotourism Society 25 years ago, and she continues to consult, fostering sustainable tourism development in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, managing projects for USAID, the World Bank Group, and the Planetara Foundation, among others. She teaches and runs programs at Harvard and Cornell Universities, and I can go on, but let's let's start talking about this stuff. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's great that you're here. Um, so, how is the definition of sustainable or ecotourism? or sometimes called responsible tourism changed over this past quarter century like what what is it we're talking about and how has it changed well ecotourism was the first word in the field surprisingly and that was back in 1990 that it was first defined mm -hmm. by the International Ecotourism Society and that did look at responsibility of travelers it looks at how do you maintain travel in a way that doesn't harm landscapes and ecosystems and most importantly, it also looks at how to benefit local people. So all of those three parts of the definition remain in whatever type of word you use. The only evolutionary change, I would say, is, is that the growth of tourism throughout the world has made us look a lot more about how to quantify those impacts and be sure that we're getting it right. Right. And it seems that your focus is on rural areas, principally. Are they more likely to be exploited? No, actually no. I think that the reason for that was to actually bring greater benefits uh, because those people have the most to gain. Uh, they're living in rural places where poverty is much more common, where they're cut off from the benefits of the globalized uh, society that we live in. And tourism is one of the few types of international economic development tools that can really successfully be brought to those people. And what are the greatest threats to ecotourism now? Well, I would have to say that protected areas, for example, throughout the world, and there's uh, over 1,400 of them, are not receiving enough revenue from tourism. A really new study just showed that they're operating in about $10 billion a year to protect all of our globe's protected areas. And yet tourism is actually generating or could generate as much as $600 billion annually, but that's not being captured. So it's obvious that we have a long way to go, and I'm actually launching a study on that. Okay, great. And, and all other things like, you know, certainly oil development and, you know, resources, people that are trying to grab resources up. Right, uh, outside of, of protected areas or even sometimes within them, yeah. there is a very big competition for all types of uh, natural and non-renewable resources out there throughout the planet, oil being one that can happen in places like the Amazon. Yeah. Um, also water, uh, mm -hmm. the lack of water throughout the world and the fact that tourists use as much as 18 times more water than local residents for mm -hmm. every day uh, means that they're in competition more and more with local people for their water resources. Yeah. Well, we'll get to a lot of examples about the work that you do in a minute, but you know, so you grew up in New Jersey and Vermont actually influenced you early on. That's right. Um, when I just graduated from college and I was 21 years old, a friend of mine who was hiking the whole Appalachian Trail invited me to join her in New York and hike through Vermont all the way through New Hampshire. And so I came here and she left me actually for a solo through Vermont and then rejoined me. Uh, so Vermont had a very big influence on me as a human being because it was the first time that I, as a young person, was out there on my own learning how to survive in this beautiful mountainous environment. Wow. And how did your career evolve from there? I mean, how this, this, this interest in what you do? After that experience, I always wanted to work in natural areas. I never left that behind. And ultimately, I got a degree in wildlife biology, which wasn't something anyone in my family had any interest in. <laughs> <laughs> and, all, and then I moved forward with that and had the idea after 10 plus years of working at World Wildlife Fund and other conservation organizations that ecotourism could be a way of helping to preserve natural areas. And, and just backing up, when you worked f uh, for the World Wildlife Fund, you were making films with your, with your husband. So yeah. there was this communication 
piece. Um, why did you move f from that, you know, what was that all about, making, making films and helping people kind of understand that there was a problem, to wanting to do more? Yes, exactly. Well, my husband and I did two trips to Chile and Colombia with grants and a Fulbright scholarship and did documentation of wildlife in these uh, incredible wildlife reserves in Patagonia and in the rainforest of Colombia. Mm. But, it, you know, I don't think I was built to be a biologist per se. I found those things to be very fascinating, but I immediately started looking at the social and economic mm. environment in those places and found that, of course, they were struggling to survive. And that that's when I came upon the idea of tourism as a way of benefiting those people. And once I hit that, I never went back. Right. So um, you also, when you, I, I think there was some frustration. So, so you, how did you found this society? And how did, how did that work? How did you kind of follow through on that? Right. Well, I was still making films when I came back from Colombia. Uh, I made a proposal to the Audubon Society. They had a uh, documentary series at that time on television, and I proposed a whole hour length on ecotourism, which they accepted, which was a very big, exciting career break for me. Mm -hmm. And then they had to withdraw the funds because one of their sponsors pulled out. And I had already, already done about half the research. I was in touch with everyone. And so during that period of frustration, I thought, let's start an NGO. Uh, we've got all these people, no one's working on it, and then they reinitiated the funding and I was able to use the funding in order to help launch the uh, society. Yeah, and, and make that film. Um, so tourism is now one of the top industries in the world. Uh, how big is it and what portion is ecotourism? Yeah, the total tourism industry is now 9% or more, between 9 and 10% of the total global economy. Now, that includes uh, airline travel and lots of different parts of the industry, yeah, yeah. Uh, which all connects us on the planet. And it's getting bigger very rapidly. Uh, ecotourism is still a very small percentage of that. We estimate about 5% of the total travel mm -hmm. economy, which is still a lot if mm -hmm. you think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tourism can certainly be a benefit it can also be a threat. So as tourism gets stronger in countries and regions, how do you keep an experience authentic and keep tourists from ruining a place? Well, um, there's two ways of looking at it. One is from the tourist perspective. How do they actually manage themselves? And I think that's important in that they they need to look at how they book their trips, who's offering them, and what type of experiences, and be very careful about that. Uh, from the point of view of us that are working with those that deliver those experiences, uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. I think that obviously you have to work very closely with the local people and prepare them very extensively for offering tourism because otherwise they jump to a lot of conclusions. They are quick to sometimes sell out their own culture even though you know they really wouldn't if they just understood a little bit more what was going to happen. And also from the point of view of natural areas, you, you do have to work of course with governments in order to prepare them to protect those areas. So l let's talk about Angkor Wat in, C in Cambodia. A uh, number of people know this is a, um, it's, but it's kind of overrun by tourists. Uh, it's, so what are, what is threatening Angkor Wat, uh, where you, you have worked, and I, I hear it's been a little frustrating. Yes, well, Angkor Wat, I was there in 2005, um, and even at that time it was seeing a tremendous growth of tourism, and that's because of the growth of the middle class, especially mm. in Asia. Uh, so you're seeing a higher and higher percentage of uh, travelers from Asia that can quickly jump into Angkor Wat and go there. And the actual uh, monument itself is very crowded, but outside the monument in a town called Siem Reap is where the real problems lie because there's no tourism planning. And uh, I was there to help actually see if corporate social responsibility could help to protect the area. And I really found that they were powerless to do so or that the funds that they might allocate wouldn't go to the right places. So a little corruption in in there. Yes, um, because Cambodia had you know had a military government for so many years. There's still a lot of people that are you know alive and well from those early days that <coughs> actually are hiding their money in hotels up in Siem Reap. Wow. So I'm sure a lot of this also takes patience. It's like one step at a time. Of 
Right, same. well, I think, you know, when I deal, that's one of the reasons I do deal with these big groups. And some right. people might wonder, why would she work with the World Bank? And I was working for the World Bank. And that is precisely why, because it's far too difficult to operate in those environments uh, without a big, powerful ally. Right. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your work in, in Peru and around Machu Picchu, where you have been many, many times, and, and really from the beginning, it's a very special place and also in the world that many people might be familiar with. Um, how are they dealing with overcrowding, and, and how have practices changed there? Yeah, Machu Picchu, when I first went there, uh, which was in the 1990s, uh, did not have any limits on visitation, and the Inca Trail did not, nor did they have any regulations for how much porters could carry on their backs. Mm. Uh, so in order to cut costs, tour operators were putting more and more of the weight on fewer and fewer porters. And while I was there, a porter died. Oh. And I heard that, and again, this is the kind of thing that really affects you when you're actually at the place. I was not on the, that tour, but I saw them running down through the monument to get uh, to evacuate uh, the individual. And that really influenced my thinking about how important it is to regulate these types of environments. So since that time, the good news is, is that the Peruvian government has done that. They've actually limited the number of people that can hike on the Inca Trail, and they have set rules as to how many porters have to be for each tourist. Hmm. So that's been really an important hmm. uh, stride. It has limited the number of people that can go to Machu Picchu on the Inca Trail. But I think it's been a very, very important step. Right. And you're also working with people you know, around there to, to make sure that they can sell goods and uh, take advantage of, of the tourists. Yeah, what's so surprising is, is that, of course, you have the former, the descendants of the Inca are still living there. They are living a very authentic way of life in that they're farmers. And so they don't have much access to the tourism industry. Mm. So even though uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are flowing through what's called the Sacred Valley, where they live, which is right on the way, to Machu Picchu, they are not receiving very much economic benefit without help. Right. So there's been a lot of efforts, but the Planetara Foundation did a great job and invested in a community-run restaurant, which then they, them, their own company, uses, and so it became immediately profitable. Awesome. Uh, there's um, an eco-lodge deep in the Ecuadorian Amazon um, where the Harani people live. I hope that's Warani. pronounced Warani, mm -hmm. uh, that you just visited very recently. And uh, we, have, we have their, their video, so we'll watch that and, and get, a, get a sense of it, because this is not your typical tourist destination, um, but it's certainly the type of enterprise that, that might be supporting your goals. So this is a place you've got to fly there, and then you get in a boat, and you're really out there to be with and live with indigenous people, um, which is wonderful. But doesn't having you know people kind of peek into your customs and way of life put that way of life at risk? Well, the Warani have been a part of that decision-making process for 20 years, and I went there 20 years ago and just went back this year. Mm -hmm. So it was very moving, and their leader, uh, of course, received me with many of the people I first met. Oh, and uh, so uh, they ha made a very special decision that uh, they needed to do this. Um, and they're very conscious about it because um, they had a lot of threats around them primarily oil development, but also colonists, people that want to come into their territory and just farm. Yeah. And so they had to find a way to protect themselves, not just, you know, in terms of their border, but economically. They needed that kind of capacity to deal with outsiders. And when they first started this, they, they almost didn't have any income at all. They were just living in the forest. Yeah. And is that, is that working <coughs> for them? They think so. I, I was just there to discuss it with them and their leader, 
and they are under increasing threats. Uh, the current government is looking to do more oil exploration in their area. Uh, they've been holding off on that, and with the revenue that they receive from tourism, they see it as just absolutely the most important thing for them because it gives them the, the power to negotiate with government and not just be completely defenseless. Mm. Yeah. Now, is the success of ecotourism dependent on the super rich? I mean, I'm sure these, you know, getting there and, and being there is, is pricey. Actually, that trip is not. I, uh -huh. th I think ecotourism is really a middle-class phenomenon. Uh -huh. um, that type of trip, you're in a tent, um, you know, the airplane out there isn't that expensive. They put you in B&Bs when you arrive in, mm -hmm. in the, you know, Quito area, the capital of Ecuador. So, you know, the total pricing, and I've done research on this, yeah. is actually very accessible for middle-class professionals. Great. Um, now, you've also worked in Sierra Leone after a brutal civil war. Now, how do you begin to sell tourism to foundations, governments, tourists um, in a place that's, that's been so devastated? Right. Well, it takes time. Um, nothing like that can happen quickly. But what I was allowed to do is look at the potential for investment in Sierra Leone after the Civil War. And that's critical. They can't mm -hmm. do anything without investment. And I was able to successfully lay out a plan where uh, the British government, which has a very long relationship mm. with Sierra Leone, actually invested more in the development of tourism there, but ecologically oriented, culturally oriented tourism. So I'm very proud of that. Um, they were really doing well. They had some community oriented projects along spectacular beachfronts that were really doing well. And they had a pretty uh, a well protected, protected area system where I saw hippos and all kinds and they also it's have beautiful. chimpanzees and that's a major asset for them and their port is spectacular I compare it to San Francisco so Freetown is one of the most spectacular ports in the world and so they are now attracting small cruise ships you know the type that take you into these fascinating areas and even uh, of course their music uh, the Sierra Leone uh, refugees for right. example are locally well known and they are can be involved in those kinds of trips by way of uh, people visiting musicians. So there's a lot of angles to a place like that. And also, they have a very important history in the slave trade. And so from the perspective of African Americans, um, many of them may genetically be from Sierra Leone because it was the British mm. slave trade that brought people to, Amer to our part of the Americas. So, it, it, in a way, it's really, it's part of our DNA. It is, mm -hmm. and well, very much so. They estimate over 50%, perhaps, of our African Americans originally came from that region. So, this would be a very attractive place. There still is a lot in place, and of course, and then Ebola hits, so, right. and which affected all of Africa, even though it was actually not in a, in a very large area. Yeah, I have I personal saying. friends that I helped, you know, even launch, uh, uh, small businesses where they were receiving tourists and taking them on tours and they were expatriates who then moved back and then Ebola hit and it just the entire market dried up and also even in East Africa I have close friends who run very very substantial tourism enterprises there that said they saw their tourism go down 20 to 30 percent right right well hopefully that that is coming, coming, coming back. I hope so. Um, another, so if I want to travel with as much sensitivity to local customs as possible, what are some do's and don'ts for um, someone who wants to make a real connection with, with people that are there, but, you know, not be too intrusive? What are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, there's two ways to go. One is independently, of course, and the other w is with a tour operator. I personally favor, uh, surprisingly, tour operators because I think that they can put a lot more energy into the preparation for your experience and do it in a way that uh, will also help locals to prepare. Hmm. Uh, I understand that people want to do it on their own. I, I think, you know, now with this Airbnb thing, I'm a big advocate of Airbnb because hmm. that allows local people that already own properties and are not building properties uh, to benefit directly. And they play the role of host in a way that I think is just very natural and doesn't disrupt local culture. 
So there's ways of doing it uh, either way, uh, but you know you just have to be a little careful and try and make sure that you're in direct contact with folks that really know the local scene and aren't just trying to sell you a package that is then sold to someone else and someone else because frequently trips are subcontracted. Right, right. And also it kind of brings me to hotels and big hotel chains. Um, that's a whole nother kind of business that isn't necessarily eco-friendly. They're using a lot of water and linens and um, they're thinking about something else besides your goals. Well, uh, you know, what's happening in the hotel world is that um, only about 10 to 20 percent of hotels come under those big brand names that you know about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so Hilton or Wyndham, uh, they're actually putting in environmental management departments uh, that are doing more and more to manage their uh, footprint, we call it, in all of these local areas. Uh, it's a work in progress, but they are working on it. Uh, but the rest of the hotel industry doesn't have that benefit, and they also aren't being guided by good training. So right. that so, leaves a huge percentage of the hotel world still really not working on the subject. Right. Um, you also, you're ma working at two major universities. They, they tapped you to teach and run programs. And I've got to, i got to read this to <laughs> get the, so you are the director of the new International Sustainable Tourism Initiative at the Center for Health and Global Environment at Harvard. You are also a senior associate at the Cornell Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise in the management school at Cornell. What's the most exciting thing coming out of this work in academia? Well, I think that because we have now recognized that the growth of the global middle class is going to push tourism to you know, perhaps the highest impacts on the planet that we've ever seen in the next 20 years, uh, these programs are focusing on how we're going to manage that. And there, it, there are no other academic programs in the world that are mm -hmm. focusing on that. So um, it's very important. We're going to need a lot more uh, firepower uh, academically, in my opinion, to do the right analysis. And up to now, I think even though it's been wonderful work that we've done, it's been a little bit more on the, you know, light side academically. And with the tools that we now have with these high-ranking institutions and the type of students that we can get, we can get into the field, do a lot more measurements, and look at impacts in a much more quantitative way for the very first time. For example, I think my favorite is uh, that we're going to work with a tool called GeoDesign, and this is a Harvard-based project that they really in many ways helped to found this, where you can go into the field and geotag these areas and then work with local people to set up these data sets so that they can manage from their own laptops or even their mm -hmm. cell phones exactly how, say, their water table is changing. Hmm. Uh, because tourism is using a lot of water, but no one is you know, constantly measuring that. Uh, or you may want to, you know, look at other questions of community well-being. Uh, we like to use questions of how many teachers are in a classroom because tourism actually attracts a lot of immigrants. Uh, because they want to work in these locations and yet what happens is that the resources for their children or their health don't doesn't come with them and frequently you see them living in slums right outside these beautiful beachfront areas so we want to bring more equity and planning to the process of how we manage this process and uh, the United Nations for example really really got that ecotourism is something that could alleviate poverty, could deal with environmental issues. Um, has that recognition from the, from the UN helped um, the ecotourism cause? I think that every recognition helps. And we're seeing a slow change in how our global institutions view tourism. But it's still far too frequent that we're not part of large, uh, larger policy dialogues where actually, for example, ministers of tourism may not have any seat at the main cabinet level. Mm -hmm. And they are allocated to questions of how to promote the country. But in fact, they need to be much more involved with how they manage tourism in their own countries. And we're not there yet. Wow. So uh, what are the new possibilities with, with these students? With new technology, your students are from all over the world. Yeah. So 
you're really, you're probably having more impact through teaching than you're able to do with your consulting, say. Would you say? That's exactly right. <laughs> yes, and I did make that switch because uh, as I did consultancy after consultancy, I met with so many local people uh, who were well educated and managing projects at the local level, but almost to a fault, there were none that had been trained in my field. They didn't have access to that kind of education because it wasn't available locally, and even if they'd gone internationally, they hadn't find it, found it frequently. So uh, I thought, how can I reach a global audience that is interested in this information? And uh, when the Harvard opportunity came up through their extension program, which is online and in the classroom, it gives us access to all of these very bright and talented students that aren't necessarily going to leave their home country to be educated. Mm -hmm. It makes it like maybe 50 percent cheaper to get a degree with us and they can do it online and so we really reach them in ways we never could. Well we're just about out of time I'm thinking of your Brazil guy like this <laughs> that, it, that, is, that is doing work there. If we want viewers to learn more about ecotourism what would you recommend? Well, the Ecotourism Society itself, the, the ties, it's ecotourism.org, the organization that I did found 25 years ago is still active, they're online, and they do provide a lot of general information. And then of course, you know, my courses at Harvard for those that want to actually pursue it professionally are open registration, so I do encourage people to think about that. Okay, thank you so much. Megan Epler wood thank you for joining me and making the world a better place. Thank you. Vermont PBS would like to connect with you and keep the conversation going. You can always reach out with feedback and ideas at connect at vermontpbs.org. And please check out other episodes and extra materials on our website. See you next time.